Hello everyone. Today we talk about Edward the First of England's youth, civil war, and、uh, crusades. Right, that、uh, really mark an important part of English history. We already made a video about Henry the Third, Edward's father, and we have、um, managed to appreciate already the、uh, the quite important change of、um, English politics and institutions towards a sort of more National flavor,、uh, greater continuity of,、um, say, expansion within Britain, rather than France that had been lost、um, uh, largely in uh, uh, John, in uh, John that that is Edward、uh, grandfather's time.、Uh, we made a video about that too, and we're talking, of course, about a figure Longshank, right? That has quite. Uh, an appeal historiographically, pop culture, etc., because this ruler Jacques is one of one of, one of the uh, most um, important ones, not just of his era, but set right、um, the premises for what we know a bit as as the development of the English army, right?、Uh, as we know it during the Hundred Years' War, mostly in its Um, striking tactical success. Today we will not talk about that. Actually, made a video about the English conquest of Wales that,、uh, as we've seen, of course, took place under Edward. Today we do not look at that, as we do not look at、um, the invasion of Scotland, etc.、Um, all th things for for other videos. I continue、um, with,、um, let's say, English history, not through. Provinces, and、uh, unless we we're talking about the Anglo-Saxon era, where、um, everything was fragmented, but England at this point represents one of the most、um, nationally cohesive、uh, monarchies at the time, in spite of the internal dialectics that we will abundantly see、um, today、uh, with the Second、uh, uh, Barons' War, etc. There is、uh, a lot regarding、uh, the the further Regulation, but at the same time, affirmation of the English monarchy after, in fact,、um, generations of bitter infight. There is also the Crusade dimension that was the duty of every good、um, prince in in Edward's time. Right, it was much legacy. Right,、uh, from from his father, from also、uh, also a lot of international competition. Uh, and a situation in Holy Land that is desperate, especially for、uh, the, you know, the 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 great、um, the great、uh, nephew, right, of、uh, Richard Lionheart,、uh, had quite a a deep meaning, right. Edward will、uh, arrive at Acre that had been、uh, reconquered, in fact, by the same Lionheart back in the day. There was a lot of legacy to live up to. Uh, but、uh, many challenges within the same English and international politics that we will see today. Edward、um, was born at the Palace of Westminster on the night on, of June the seventeenth, eighteen twelve thirty nine. His father was notoriously、uh, King Henry the Third. Made an entire video about him.、Uh, his mother was Eleanor of Provence. That was a、um, Quite literate woman, by the way, from the circle that we'll see now of the Savoyards, fundamentally that had become quite important、uh, at, at the English court for、um, again specific reasons. I'll explain later.、Uh, and Edward's name is particularly relevant given the fact that no Norman ruler、uh, up to that point had、uh, essentially used this uniquely Anglo-Saxon name, right? Uh, and the reason why Edward was baptized just three days uh, later uh, at Westminster Abbey with with this name is that、um, Henry was particularly、uh, devout to Saint Edward the Confessor, right, former King of England, that had, in some ways at least, paved the way for the、uh, Norman succession. Before Harold Godwinson took power, etc. But say we will see this also in much greater depth at some other point.、Um, and this name, of course, was even though these were essentially Frenchmen to 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 a cultural linguistical degree, the 
reconsideration of a more properly uh, Anglo-Saxon dimension, so an English dimension by this point, um, that Edward definitely embodies. I would say for the first time there is a watershed, right? Henry is still, let's say, living up to the legacy of the dynastic issues of the Norman Plantagenet uh, dynasties. He is um, also criticized as a ruler because he was deemed to be weak. He wanted to avoid civil war and he couldn't quite, at least um, in the end of his reign, uh, uh, that's a matter of point, but there is no doubt that his long reign, his ideology of also sanctity, etc., his more tolerant behavior, um, especially after, say, the, the baronial, the major baronial prerogatives had been laid out uh, since the, the Magna Carta, tried to keep things together for the benefit of, of, of the country's unity, to a degree. Um, yet he was, in this sense, stepping back from the greater, more combative legacy of, say, his father, uh, that in spite of, uh, that I consider actually one of the greatest kings in, in English history. I've had lots of British audience saying, are you kidding me? I, you know, how can you say it about John, etc.? Well, because the way he handled that, even in failure, was actually a, a, an enormous deal to uh, to pull off. But Again, I made a video about that, too. And again, um, a time that still wasn't considering fully that sort of uh, national monarchic becoming, right, of the King of England, to the degree that especially the the, the, the ties with the French, um, uh, with, the, with the continent, uh, the French possessions were, um, let's say, were, were, were entailing historically. Um, and we will see now Edward's history through that same lens, because uh, there was a part of that legacy leading into him uh, as well, right? Henry, there were pretty sad stories about, even, of course, within the the top nobility, of, you know, child, severe child mortality, um, labor death, etc. Um, Edward was greeted uh, with great celebrations, both the, uh, the royal court and throughout all of England, right? And uh, from there on, he was called Lord Edward, right? Until his very accession to the throne that we will um, finish with today in 1272, right? There were interesting, uh, say, figures in his, in his uh, early age that would stick with him, Especially his cousin Henry of Almain, right? This was the, um, the 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 son of Richard of Cornwall that we have seen. It was Henry the Third's brother, um, king of the Romans, right? In the videos about the great interregnum in Germany, we've seen it often. And quite a sort of um, at least a guy was proposed for different roles. We've seen it well in Ed, uh, Henry the Third's policy. They tried to to place different um, different. Uh, members of the royal house, different thrones, right, moments of great distress, right, the, the Swabian succession, etc. Um, Henry of Almain was thus uh, Edward's cousin, and he would remain a close companion of the prince for the rest of his life, right. Uh, as preceptor, he had Hugh Gifford, um, after uh, the death of woman 1246, he was uh, tutored by uh, Bartholomew Pact, right? Uh, and even though we do not have specific details about Edward's educational curriculum, we can say that it was pretty typical for a, an aristocrat of his uh, time uh, and age. We know that he was given, he was taught military studies, right? Uh, again, we know a few about that, but it's obvious that it was, especially in the 13th century, great emphasis on uh, the chivalric expectations of monarchs, of, you know, such great uh, importance for dynastic reason, and also for, for their incolumity, um, etc. Right. Uh, speaking of Edward's health, initially he gave um, some uh, scare, definitely, because gave a scare multiple times when he fell ill, when he was um, seven, eight, 
and and 12 um, so again this were serious issues at the time yet right uh, he grew old to be a quite uh, strong athletic and also imposing man as he was 188 centimeters tall that at the time was uh, even a more impressive height given that humans were slightly shorter um, and it was important for a 13th century nobleman to have such physical characteristics because this was uh, still the center actually was the, the center in which the sort of combination between the individual martial uh, skills and bodily uh, involvement in the same was at the peak of synchrosis right this was the century of, of knighthood of chivalry where properly feudal warfare reached its moral cultural and technological apex right so a strong athletic imposing person um, was also more of a warrior was admired uh, biologically morally right and um, Edward was also just good-looking right he had uh, blonde hair that sort of darkened um, over time well he turned gray white uh, with age um, but um, he had, in fact, impressive limbs and he could exert himself on horseback in combat um, impressively. Um, he had one physical irregularity that we know of, that is to say the pathosis, blepharopathosis, that is to say the more commonly termed drooping eyelid, um, the left one specifically. And in spite of a lisp, uh, his speaking abilities were good, right? The guys were persuasive. This was particularly important for a ruler in the first place and, you know, at court and, say, in, in, in the face of those who would have had to support the next king, etc., being able to speak uh, effectively, um, fluently and cogently was, of course, uh, quite important. We can imagine, all again, the, uh, the full standards of... Of a would be uh, of a presumptive heir right to the English throne, like in this case. In 1254, uh, the English were worried that the Castilians could invade Gascony, that was one of the French possession of the Plantagenets. This brought uh, Edward's father to solve the problem by mm, essentially marrying Edward at the time 15 years of age with the 13 year old Anna, Eleanor uh, we mentioned her before the daughter of Ferdinand III of Castile and as such half sister of the current King Alfonso X and that was an, a, a very highly prestigious uh, you know uh, business uh, in the first place because Alfonso X and Henry III these were some of the greatest um, rulers uh, together with Louis IX uh, Frederick II uh, of their times right the couple got married on November the 1st 1254 in the Cistercian um, nuns uh, abbey of Santa Maria la Real de las Huelgas in Castille, right, uh, just uh, out of the city of Burgos. And as part of the marriage agreement, Alfonso X gave up his claims to Gascony. Also, Edward received, as a dowry from his wife, 15,000 marks a year, right, which is definitely a uh, a princely if a royal dowry uh, this marriage eventually brought to the English acquisition of Pontieu that is in the north it's, it's close to the channel you know it's basically between Normandy and Flanders right Abbeville uh, 
uh, Montreuil sur Mer, uh, in spite of the fact Montreuil is not part of the county of Pontieu, but uh, uh, it's there. This happened in 1279, and it was part of Eleanor's, uh, uh, say, cause because she inherited the same county. So this was yet another important acquisition, after all, uh, on the channel, right? It was still, of course, a French possession, de facto, but, you know, but, uh, was used by by Edward. Henry provided Edward with sizable endowments, including Gascony, right? Uh, there was a thing with Ireland since the time of John and then with Henry, etc., uh, and Henry II even before, um, representing a bit of a testing ground of the abilities of the heir to the English throne, the island was granted to Edward by his father with the stipulation that it would never be separated from the English crown. This was a practice required simply by the fact that at some point, as we will see also with Edward, Again, civil wars could break out, sons could disobey their father, uh, etc. And uh, Ireland, of course, was more um, distant from England, could be a base to support uh, say some political exiles, expeditions towards the same England. Ed, um, Edward was provided by his father with large amounts, large estates in, in Wales, in England as well, including the earldom of Chester. Uh, these lands were important because eventually Edward would uh, conquer Wales from from there, from the north. Um, and so it was a, an area that he knew well before, also having there some uh, Welsh uh, 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 exiles uh, hosted uh, in Chester, etc. Edward in this way was fundamentally autonomous, right? He had a little independence even, uh, especially in Ireland, as it was uh, normal. He got really a substantial income from those lands. I mean, they were not particularly productive, as you know, but made videos about medieval Ireland, but they were extensive, right? And the English rule there was consolidating to an important degree. Um, Simon de Montfort, the 6th Earl of Leicester, was appointed as Royal Lieutenant of Gascony in 1253. This helped Edward in Gascony, which effectively prevented Edward from deriving actual authority and revenue from that province that... Um, was also um, his to, to manage, right? After their marriage at the end of November 1254, Edward and Eleanor left Spain. They entered Gascony and were warmly greeted by the local population. These things, you know, at the French-Spanish border, you know, quite frequent, like in Western European royalty, um, and of course Edward was to reach this land ruled by, uh, namely by, by his father, um, that he was, however, controlling formally as prince and lord. Right. This, um, of course, was reflects uh, an increasing independence of Edward had just married, so now could produce and would produce hairs. Um, and so reinforcing his position just as prince, as um, heir to the English throne. From 1254 to 1257, Edward um, was essentially under the influence of his mother's relatives that were the so-called faction of the Savoyards. Right? These had uh, always been uh, as essentially a Burgundian nobility, right, part of French, uh, English politics, etc. And they had 
soundly uh, sided with the monarchy ever since they established themselves in numbers in, in England after a royal marriage with the uh, and uh, between the Salyards and the English. And they represented, a, of course, a pro-monarchy uh, position, given that they depended on it um, and its legitimacy, as opposed to the nobility or the baronial faction that tended to instead see them as uh, as aliens, as people that fundamentally were exploiting the same English um, country, um, infringing on their prerogatives as monarchic uh, agents, fundamentally. The most famous Savoyard was Peter II, known as Little Charlemagne, right Count of Savoy from 1263, later on, until his death five years later, the English Queen's uncle. After 1257, however, Edward passed more on to the uh, Lusignan faction. This was yet another uh, foreign clan, right? French origin, right? That uh, had basically played a similar role, right? They were the half brothers of Henry's father, Henry III. That included individuals like William de Valence. This connection was particularly important because both the Savoyards and the Lusignans were, again, uh, basically the same as far as the enmity with the English barons, right? And this uh, tension, this conflict was fueling further the sort of reform, so you know that it's not just the Magna Carta that um, set those particular characteristics that um, in the, the English monarchy acquired institutionally in the late Middle Ages, right, there were different provisions later on, we'll see them now, uh, in part because Edward was involved with this. Um, as a consequence, by the way, Edward's ties with these uh, clans, let's say, was seen uh, unfavorably by at least those contemporaries that, of course, were m not necessarily openly, but, say, more f sympathetic, right, to to the baronial cause. For example, Matthew Paris uh, was writing in his chronicle that um, Edward's behavior uh, was questionable given that this uh, circle he frequented was uh, acting in sort of violent and unruly ways. We can't imagine how, say, arrogant these aristocrats really were and how, say, uh, we are in the 13th century, right? There's not really a, a state like the one we live in today. So these people could do really a lot of things um, on their own and people were, say, questioning whether Edward at that point would have been a good um, heir to the English throne. At 16 years old, Edward was already acting quite independent in political matters. For example, he sided with the Soleil family in Gascony while they were feuding against the Colomb one. Uh, and uh, this was actually against Henry III's policy of actual mediation between the, the, the two parts. In May 1258, a group of magnates drew up a document for uh, reforming the king's government. It's important to stress the, the kings because um, they were seeing themselves as the actual people, as the actual barons. These are the famous provisions of Oxford, right? Developed back during the Oxford Parliament of 1258, right? Of course, they were all aiming to ensure the king adhering to the rule of law, governing according to the advice of the barons, so having this interference, etc. And specifically, um, these provisions were politically and largely directed against the Lusignan clan. Um, and Edward, who was loyal to the latter, essentially strongly opposed the provisions for this reason. 
by the way, the provisions of Oxford passed, uh, so much so that the same losing now uh, lost power in the process, which in turn uh, changed the same Edward's attitude towards them. In March 1259, um, he allied himself with one of the same reformers, actually one of the main ones as well, it was Richard de Clare, uh, 5th Earl of Hertford, 6th Earl of Gloucester, 2nd Lord of Glamoran, 8th Lord of Clare, right, it's, we, we name him just like the 6th uh, Earl of Gloucester, and in October, the same Edward uh, announced that he was supporting the baronial goals, as well as their leader, the main leader, the Earl of Leicester. You understand how, say, floating, wavering, uh, shifting these allegiances were, but it was all part of the game, like naturally we don't know in, in depth about Edward's personal beliefs on the matter, you know that there is a sort of ransom later on. Now, the motive behind Edward's change of heart could, in fact, be just practical. Um, the Earl of Leicester was, for example, uh, quite supportive of Edward's policy in Gascony. The king, by the way, left uh, for France in November of 1259. And Edward, at that point, began to insubordinate openly. Right? For example, he made several appointments to push for further the agenda of the barons. Um, his father was rightfully fearing uh, his son to make a coup and so overthrow him while he was in another country. Also, when Harry came back to France, he didn't quite want to meet his son. He refused um, to, to see him, practically. However, there was finally a mediation between um, Richard of Cornwall, right, his brother, and Boniface, the Archbishop of Canterbury. This was Boniface of Savoy, by the way, that uh, had, you know, made his uh, fortune in England as well. Um, and uh, Edward and his father were finally reconciled by this mediation, because there was no, say, immediate need to simply make this civil war break out at that point. Um, however, Edward was sent to France, not as an exile, but de facto to keep him away, not say, say to diffuse most of the tension that had been mounting. In November 12, uh, 1260, he decided to come back with the Lusignan clan, right? That was also in France there and, and had been exiled uh, at that point after the Oxford provisions, right? So um, it was a sort of setback for Edward's personal ambitions, but at least, let's say, say the, the order of the country remained for, for a couple of years, as we'll see now. Um, Edward, by the way, had a, an argument with some of his former Lusignan friends over some financial matters um, in England, by the way. In 1263, Henry sent his son on a uh, campaign in Wales against uh, Llewellyn ab Gruffydd, right, the Welsh uh, prince that had come to power in 1258, began to give some headache uh, to, the, to the English, and, you know, we, we have seen the history of the guy and Edward in the video about the English conquest uh, of Wales. Um, and initially, this, um, this is not, as you know, when, when the actual uh, conquest happened, on the contrary, uh, the prince's for it's uh, Edward's. I mean, not the prince of Wales, right? The prince of England forces were besieged. It, it's kind of ironic because eventually it's from Edward that the, <laughs> the English princes would have been the, the princes of Wales, um, as heir to the English throne. Um, but at the time, it was actually besieged in northern Wales uh, by his foes and couldn't really do much uh, there 
the same time. It was not a major expedition, but you know, it was at least aimed at settling part of the matter. Leicester, that uh, had been out of England since 1261, let's remember this was the uh, leader of, of the barons, right, had returned to Britain and rebooted fundamentally the baronial uh, instances against the king, etc. So Henry seemed ready even to give way to the baronial demands that, especially in, in the face of uh, Edward's reconciliation with his father, as you understand, seemed to have sort of fallen, right? If Edward was not with them anymore, um, they needed to act, right? Um, and uh, this was still a sort of undecided situation which Edward began to take control. However, he would settle for good and surprisingly after all because of the way eventually the devotion with which he pursued the protection of his father's royal rights with in fact Henry III against the barons right so this meant war of course that was breaking out in, in England Edward gathered some uh, some individuals that he had first alienated the previous year we're talking about the same Henry of Almain, his cousin, then John de Varenne, the sixth, uh, the sixth Earl of Surrey, right? One of really uh, one of the most valiant noble men and and military commander, right? He would actually switch sides twice, but say we're not making his story here specifically. We'll talk and at some point with this uh, man, Edward managed to retake Windsor Castle from the rebels. Um, this was the first um, engagement uh, in the in the, in the war from by by, by Edward from from Ed, for Edward. There was, however, a uh, an arbitration, uh, an international one, by Louis the Ninth of France, known as the Mise of Amiens. Right on January the twenty third, twelve sixty four, that fundamentally supported the royalist cause. He said, "Well, you know, where because Louis the Ninth was so let's say already in order of sanctity in his life, and he was very uh, famous and experienced. And so he had even fought against Harry himself back in the day and won some of the, uh, of the." most um, uh, famous battles of the time. I mean, there had been really a lot of conflict, but he realized it was better to support a stable England, after all, and so to side with, with King. Um, this um, uh, wouldn't quite stop, let's say, the war, which in fact dragged on uh, for three years, basically. But it did provide the Royalists with an important support that would turn to be be useful in, in a war that was very twisted as far as the odds were concerned, as we'll see now. Um, the baronial forces were led in the war by the aforementioned Earl of Leicester. Right. Um, the uh, the faction that stayed loyal to the king was less numerous. All right, so this was hell of a struggle also for for Edward. Um, he captured, managed to capture the rebellious city of Gloucester. During the siege, Robert de Ferrer, sixth Earl of Derby, uh, an English nobleman, came to the relief of the of the stronghold with. Uh, uh, a rebellious force in support of, of, of the barons. This obliged Edward to negotiate a truce with the same earl. However, the prince would later break the terms of this agreement and he captured Northampton from Simon de Montfort the Younger. Uh, this was essentially the son of um, the sixth Earl of Leicester, right? 
So that was quite a quite a an important blow. Um, then Edward embarked himself on a campaign against Derby's lands to retaliate against his interference in the siege of Gloucester. One of the major battles of the war was the Battle of Blues that we will see uh, at some point hopefully in a battle video. This was fought on May the 14th, 1264. Edward commanded the right of the royal army and he did well um, except he sort of lost um, the, the point of the broader picture because he managed to crush the London contingent that the Earl of Leicester had brought. Um, it was on his left. However, after the enemy was scattered, Edward wouldn't come back to uh, assist the rest of the royal army that was overrun by the rebels. And this actually led to the same capture of Edward and his cousin Henry of Almain, right? Um, in the so-called Mise of Luz, this brought Edward and his cousin uh, as hostage of Leicester. Edward remained imprisoned until March 1265. At this point, he was released but kept under strict surveillance in Hereford. He managed finally to escape um, on May the 28th. He uh, exploited, um, say, a riding out, and he managed to link up with Gilbert, uh, Gilbert de Clare, the uh, sixth Earl of Hereford uh, and seventh Earl of Gloucester who uh, had uh, recently defected the barons to the king's side. So they managed to cross their, their path uh, successfully. The Earl of Leicester's support was now dwindling, by the way, for reasons we can't quite uh, digress on. Um, Edward himself took the command of the force that recovered Borcester, and Gloucester, with ease, telling the truth. Meanwhile, Leicester had allied himself with Welsh. This was uh, actually uh, a light motive of the baronial and sort of the, most of the midline support that they received, siding with the Celtic fringe uh, in the west, um, and marched with this now uh, Anglo-Welsh um, force to link up um, with the one of his son Simon. Edward managed to make a surprise attack at Kenilworth Castle in Warwickshire. At this point, the younger Montfort was taken and quartered right, before moving on to cut off the Earl of, of Leicester. This, this tells you the, the degree of violence, by the way. It was flaring. That was, was really the showdown here which occurred at the Battle of Evesham, fought on August the 4th, 1265. This is the defeat of Simon de Montfort and the rebellion baron uh, by the future King Edward, who led the forces of his father right, on this occasion. So it's a big deal. We will see this battle as well in a video on its own. Um, one should give that the Earl of Leicester did not have enough troops, right, so that the, the battle was uh, a bit, uh, it would say, in order uh, to be fought, of course it was relevant, but after um, the, the defeat, the same Earl was killed and basically chopped to pieces on the field, famously enough, so this is the fate uh, of traitors. There were some aspects of how the civil war had just been brewing and eventually um, the way Edward behaved on this occasion. We've seen that he had initially backed the barons in his youth, right? And then he had now passed his father and that was okay, but still sort of breaking ties with former 
uh, say the people he had at least meant they promised something to um, and the fact of uh, deceiving Derbyt Gloucester and having him massacred wasn't exactly you know the, the top of chivalry um, the same uh, illusion like the fact that he had escaped from prison he was also seen given that it was done after a previous oath of course but okay it was the child of the circumstances but uh, at the same time this sort of untrustworthiness uh, of Edward shown true uh, for the standards of the time um, in any case he was young he was still learning right and he sort of redeemed himself through his action first of all uh, supporting his father fighting uh, winning for him uh, the war fundamentally and also uh, f forgiving some enemies that he had uh, brought uh, to the knees um, this um, this was important also for just uh, his following reign right to heal the wounds of the civil war in a sense the, the war did not simply uh, simply ended like that right because even though the Earl of Leicester was dead um, the country was still in turmoil uh, and Edward had to go on fighting in Christ uh, on Christmas 1265 he reached a an agreement with Simon the Younger and his associates at the Isle of Axholm in Lincolnshire um, and in the March of the following year he successfully assaulted the sunk port that is this historic group of coastal towns in southeast England so mostly Kent and Sussex basically they are the, say the, the best uh, naval bases right in uh, so the, the five arbors uh, in in French uh, at least it alludes to the to the really original five members uh, and in the 13th century they, they had been rising in, in, in importance and of course seizing them meant to have basically the control of at least the English coastline as far as the channel crossing was concerned which was, was of course was quite relevant during a civil war where of course from France also other people could uh, could come and also go to um, etc there was especially a, a tough nut to crack in the impregnable Kenilworth castle defended by a contingent of rebels that basically held out until the draft of the so-called Dictum of Kenilworth on October the 31st 1266 which pronounced um, say was pronounced at least in order to reconcile the rebels of the second baron's war with the royal government in England uh, in April it seems as if the Earl of Gloucester would um, take up the baronial cause of reforming royal government um, so civil war with a good season would start over again yet after a renegotiation of the terms of the dictum of Kenilworth the parties came to a final agreement at this point Henry was still in charge of course his position had been substantially undermined and Edward naturally had also increased instead dramatically in importance he was made around this time steward of England and as such he mm, essentially represented the monarch right uh, in his legal rule also he was appointed as Lord Warden of the Sankport in 1265 it's a post dating to at least the 12th century uh, and uh, again being in charge of the sunk port was uh, particularly prestigious uh, and 
was just also close to London to the to the broader connection of the capital and the, of course the 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 royal coast had been mostly sustained from the southeast right as it was normal most of the time though of course the the various outposts in spite of the position that he had reached it was rather uh henry who maintained control over the negotiations the sort of the peace settlements uh in england and part of the reason was that edward was now instead concentrated on his forthcoming crusade right this was a, an international one uh a one that would practically fail because of the death of the main leader that was louis the ninth we'll see it but you know how it went if you know medieval history if it had if this was aimed at essentially seizing egypt and then the holy land right and the aragonese brought an enormous amount of troops the the french too the, the english now we'll see what the contingent it was modest but good right and with the same prince um so it would have if if uh, it hadn't been for the plague in tunis and the death of louis etc things would have likely gone in very in a very different way and the interesting aspect this is uh this crusade is counted as the uh sort of strange because the you know that the crusades at some point until it's the first the second the third aside from the smaller ones but if you count them at some point you have the eighth crusade according to some count it would be the one of Louis the ninth and then basically the prosecution of the saint is also called the ninth crusade uh and specifically lord edward's crusade uh, at some point we can look at it in detail because there are sort of pretty messed up things going on including you know, edward almost assassinated by in fact the, the famed assassins um uh his wife that had of course followed him sucked of um you know his wound after the because they feared was poison uh and uh and he you know he barely escaped with his life after that because it was a, a pretty severe experience and he consistently risked to die at that point um but this tells you also just after all this mess that had happened what do you want to do i want to go on crusade okay the guy was young admittedly and so a lot of energy a lot of hype a lot of oh my god i'm the next king of england think about that right and what's on your shoulders practically um so um this um this was also a bit the age of that you know that henry the third's tomb uh henry died while his son was at the crusade as we will see now and you know that henry's grave is very influenced by a roman papal um let's say style by this idea of sanctity it was around as we've seen the same louis the ninth um edward was projected in a world of very high values in times in which feudal monarchies especially like the, the french the english one we've seen also the the castilian bride and so on it was a big deal right and every great ruler had to have in his curriculum uh, uh, such enterprise so um edward celebrated uh a ceremony on June the 24th 1268 in which he uh, pledged himself to undertake the crusade this is the same year of Talia Costa Benoli just to tell you what times this were Charles of Anjou Conradin of Swabia we will see all these things in some depth hopefully soon um also uh, in the ceremony uh, his cousin Henry of Albany and his brother Edmund crouch back uh the the first earl of lancaster participated uh pl pledged the uh, say to undertake the crusade uh and uh, and leave there were some enemies former foes of edwards that uh, took up arms for the crusade such as uh john de vichy right um and the seventh earl of gloucester right the latter however would not participate at the end of the day but this is just what was expected to many of, of their rank in the first place um so the country the court 
uh, was pacified. So the main problem now was just the financial one of arming the crusade, right? Louis the Ninth of France, that was as we've seen, bit the leader, the, or the major organizer, the, the great wise guy, and you know, international figure that would have to say the various affairs of the country, provided um, England with a loan of about 1,500 pounds. This was not enough for, for the crusade, so that the rest um, of the money had to be raised through a direct tax on the lady, right? That this was also a pretty uh, rare eventuality. Last time it had been done was 1237. In May 1270, the English Parliament granted the levy of a tax of one twentieth of all movable property. Uh, in exchange, Henry III agreed to reconfirm the Magna Carta, the Bertatum, uh, also to impose new restrictions on Jewish money lending. This was finally enough for Edward to sail from Dover to France on August the 20th, 1270. Uh, we do not know exactly how large the English force was, but it was quality, for sure, given that it had 225 knights over uh, less than 1,000 men. Likely, at least we're not totally sure of this, because... Again, believe me, I, I've been working, I've been writing hundreds of pages, literally, about <laughs> the numbers of medieval armies, um, in at least among the types of hundreds of pages. I, I write also about other topics. But um, the... Uh, let's say it's always complicated to, to divide, say, fighting troops from aid, etc. I don't know specifically the, the very sources for reconstructing this info. They are mostly conjectural, I suppose. And, or at least we have this precise number, but likely um, not the, the wall, the, the information on the wall complement. But 225 knights from the finest English ones for the expedition that was counting thousands of them is is okay right not too much as you understand yet edward participated and with this force he went on at the end of the day almost alone right given that as you know uh, the uh, crusaders should have um at that point moved towards um acre in palestine um, and there was some general plan also for Egypt, uh, etc. At that point, the Mamluks were threatening the, um, in fact, the stronghold from, uh, from which you could... I made a video about the fall of Acre that occurred, as you know, in the end of, of the 13th century. So you have a picture there of more or less what that siege warfare looked like. The main route had to follow the path of Louis the Ninth, who initially wanted to um, uh, pass from Sicily, but was convinced eventually by his brother not to do so, and so to actually attack the Emirate of Tunis and establish this first sort of stronghold in in North Africa, and to proceed there, eventually towards uh, the Levant, right. Um, the thing ended in disaster, notoriously, on August the 25th. Louis died with lots of his army and other part family members, by the way, and part of the nobility and the rest of the troops because of an epidemic. When Edward finally reached Tunisia, Charles had already signed a treaty with the local emir, right, and basically the crusaders were heading back to Sicily and from there back home across Italy, basically, they, they didn't even have the money to come back to France easily, so they left here and there some bomb of Louis the Ninth as a relic along the, the path, you know, normally the people were boiled, uh, and just to, because it was impossible to preserve the body, um, 
in in August at those latitudes uh, and uh, for the long trip etc so um, there was some at this point autumn kicked in so the crusaders that remained decided to leave the, the next spring right when however a devastating storm of the Sicilian coast brought the St. Charles and Philip III from wanting to, to campaign any further. It's at this point that the English contingent instead went on alone. Right? This is a very courageous act. Uh, of course, remember that um, these people were of the same blood of Richard Lionheart. Uh, Acre was, of course, um, uh, say quite a name, in, of course, considering... Um, Richard, uh, Richard's accomplishment, and so um, uh, the same Edward wanted to repeat the feat of his great great uncle, or whatever what it was that. Um, so here he landed finally in Acre on May the ninth, twelve seventy one, and the situation was not easy. Right uh, at this point, again we have the Mamluks that are threatening. Uh, the last true stronghold of the kingdom of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is fallen, but Acre holds out uh, as a very important citadel. Um, the uh, here some year, say some decades before, you know, Frederick II had managed to get back Jerusalem from the Muslims n n just out of an agreement that basically. Uh, would have not really brought the city back to, to Christendom as such. Eventually, the the, the Karasmians had retaken the city and made a massacre and so on. Pretty terrible sword. Um, and receiving Jerusalem at this point would just the English contingent was impossible, by the way. And on the contrary, was the Mamluk uh, Sultan Baibar to be threatening now the last. Stronghold to bake. Um, Edward's troops uh, arrived actually to stiffen the Christian resistance in front of the Mamluk onslaught, uh, but they couldn't quite get out there and, pa and take in the initiative because the Mamluks were really, in fact, much more than them. There was a raid led just out of saying, "We are here." Um, near to saint georges de le in, in June. But it basically brought to no, to no consequence, right? An especially useful one for the Crusaders. There was, however, uh, another card that could be played internationally and diplomatically, that is to say, to uh, ask the Mongols of uh, the Ilkhanate of Persia, under Abaka Khan, to uh, attack the Mamluks in Syria, Aleppo specifically, so distracting Baibar's forces. Uh, I made multiple videos about Mongol and Mamluk uh, warfare, we will keep talking about them also um, in the near future, hopefully, uh, and you know what frontier, especially in the north, existed between these two peoples. We talk about the Vafidiya, the sort of very shaded, sort of hybrid frontier. Um, and all the very interesting sort of melange of military cultures. Uh, the Ilkhan failed ultimately to receive Aleppo, which would have caused major, you know, consequences regionally. It wouldn't happen. It was not the first time that the Christians had hoped for the Mongols to sort of attack the Saracens, uh, broadly meant, but. Um, this was uh, at least also a process gradually uh, changing given that the Mongols were converting to Islam themselves in the area. But um, at least the Ilkhanate always had historically from Persia this interest in the Near East. So that was at least a strategy that could be played on in this case. In November of uh, the same 1271, Edward raided Kakun, which is a Palestinian village um, northwest of the city of Tulkar, 
right? This is the only entrance basically to the Mount Nablus from the coastal uh, Sharon plain. Um, this was very strategic in nature because from there Jerusalem could be reached, right? But aside from the fact that there would have not been forces really to quite, you know, take on Jerusalem just per se, the raid on Kakun was unsuccessful, right? Which grew the despair in Acre. In May 1272, Hugh III um, of Antioch Lusignan, who was still, among others, the nominal king of Jerusalem, and as such represented, for both reason, the sort of more immediate fuel to any kind of uh, ultramar uh, military uh, activity, signed a 10-year truce with Baibar, right? Of course, there were reasons uh, from both sides that we can't quite digress on. Uh, just Edward didn't quite like this decision because he wanted to be the great crusade hero. In June 1272, however, was victim of the aforementioned assassination attempt by the um, a member, at least of, of the Syrian order of the assassins, the Nizaris. My I made a video about them, which illustrates what they really were about. Um, it's uh, believed that the same Bybars had fundamentally commissioned this uh, assassination attempt that was almost successful, right? The guy managed to enter in Edward's tent, right? So just think about how uh, sneaky, right, they is, the swift they were. Um, Edward killed the assassin with his own hand, right? He was struck in the arm by this, uh, again, dagger that was feared to be poisoned uh, in the following month. He was debilitated psychophysically, which is what brought, finally, an end uh, to the campaign. Because there was simply no, not enough support right, to repeat the deeds of the Lionheart, and just uh, the English alone could have not made it, given the situation of Acre, right? That That's a pretty clear. Um, Edward left the lab hand on September the 24th of the same year. He went to Sicily, which was normally uh, the, the case, uh, where he was reached by the news of his father's death that had occurred uh, on the previous year, right, the no November the 16th, 1271, which we have also discussed, in fact, in the video about Henry III. Edward was very sad because of this. Uh, but because just think about the relation between these people, right? They, they were just in the hands of politics in many ways. They they loved each other, had feelings, whatever. Um, and of course it means just a lot, uh, right? Uh, whoever your father is. And uh, that relationship was... Just that's how it had to be. Like the the father dies, the son takes power, right? It's one of the most important uh, moments in the life of a man, and especially someone who has to be the king of England, right? Um, there was some time, however, that Edward kept spending um, abroad, right? Um, there was really no reason, right? Uh, politically to come back to England earlier, right? The lion hurt had a, had a completely different story. Like he wanted to come back, but he was uh, held. But here, and there was not a, uh, a, there was not an inherent danger, or immediate necessity of um, Edward to be in England. Without mentioning, he was still healing from the the, assass the assassination attempt. So he sort of took a journey, like a, almost a vacation, so considered that he had some money to spend anyway, um, and um, considered that England had now settled successfully for good most of the problems, right? most of the baronial issues uh, 
Henry the Third's reign is very overblocked. Um, we have we have described this, I think, um, effectively enough on, on the other video. Um, and Edward is the consequence, if you want, of this, right? Of this rearrangement of this final struggle, but finally of, of a settlement of a country that now can dedicate to today we do not cover we have already seen it the conquest of, of Wales then the say various administrative reforms right and then of course the um, the Scottish issues other constitutional affairs it was not easy to reign just like that but you know it um, it was surely better than it had been before at some point so what did Edward do before coming back First of all, he was sure that the Royal Council in England was being governed by Robert Burnell, uh, an English bishop who served with such effect as Lord Chancellor of, of England. Uh, also later, like in the wake of this um, office, right, between 1274 and 1292, a native of Shropshire, right, he really entered this way in the service of Edward. So, first of all, uh, from Sicily, the now uh, would-be king, or de facto king, passed through Italy and France. Now, on this occasion, he visited Pope Gregory X, Teobaldo Visconti, right, quite a key figure also in the relation with, uh, with the Angevins, with with the empire, he paid homage to Philip the Third when he arrived in Paris, and this obviously for the uh, French domains like Ponthieu, Gascony, etc. So this was just um, a proper way to say salute the new, say the contemporary ruler. Again, they had been. Uh, both children of two great kings that had had their differences and but also they had supported each other as we've seen also between Italy and France Edward passed the uh, the Savoy right and here he received the homage from his uncle Philip the first right that had prior to that office been the Bishop of Balance, by the way, an Archbishop of Lyon, so quite, uh, quite a figure. This homage was connected to some castles in the Alps that were held for, the, for Edward by a treaty of 1246, and that naturally dated back to, in fact, uh, his father's uh, agreements with the with Savoy, right? Edward also went to Gascony, and he crushed a revolt led by the twentieth Viscount of Bearn, uh, Gaston the Seventh de Montsada, known as Froissart. While in Gascony, Edward got pretty interested in his various possessions there. He was. Um, he would be known during his reign for his administrative efficiency. So consider just the the legal uh, problems that could arise from a largely, you know, customary feudal and in part also more strictly legalized system at different levels, right? So it was important to um, to appreciate, right? The, um, his position of Lord in Aquitaine, right, and also of course meeting with the various, um, uh, with the various noblemen, his subjects, getting acquainted, because even the memory of a king was having sojourn in in the era it was important to the ends of government, right. There was from there um, reactivation of his connections with with um, Castilia. Consider that at this point um, his four-year-old daughter, Eleanor, was promised 
in marriage to Alfonso the Third, who would become Alfonso the Third, um, King of Aragon in Valencia, as well. And so there were negotiations there with Castilla necessarily. Also, Edward's uh, heir at, at the moment, Henry, uh, who would tragically die um, on the same 1274 was betrothed with John I, who would become the first ruling Queen of Navarre, as well as Countess of Champagne, and we've seen partly her story in the video about the County of Champagne. We will talk also about um, the Kingdom of Navarre, of, of which she was a heiress, right? And so, um, unfortunately, none of those. Henry died, as we've seen. Um, Eleanor um, also wouldn't quite go on to marry with uh, Alfonso of Aragon. In any case, it was a, a good thing to try uh, in the first place. Edward finally came back to England on August the 2nd, 1274. He was crowned formally King of England at Westminster Abbey on August the 19th. He was 35 years old at that time. Right, and consider just even the again the biological chronological factor like in someone's life what that means um, and uh, of course uh, Queen Eleanor was crowned as well also the, he was immediately uh, anointed by the Archbishop of Canterbury Robert Kilworthy who was, by the way, the first member of a mendicant order to attain uh, such a high, and a high in the first place, ecclesiastical office in the English church. And times were changing. Mendicant orders were becoming fast. Some of the most literate and educated, um, you know, groups in Europe, also as teachers at universities and so on. Um, at that point, um, Edward removed his own crown, saying that he would have not worn it uh, again until he would have not recovered all what had been um, uh, the, the crown lands that his father had surrendered for different reasons during his reign. And this was definitely a, a display of, uh, of great ambition. Uh, and capacity that he would prove um, of a role during his reign, making him one of the most, um, I would say, iconic uh, rulers uh, in medieval England, uh, at least say, later medieval times. You really have a an important shift, especially in English foreign policy, um, regarding the reclaiming, especially of the British dimension. Uh, of such rule, and uh, I think that's that's quite an important aspect. Um, in any case, we will see further Edward's exploit in other videos for today. However, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.